Uh, and I regularly see him in other countries. <laughs> I don't think I've seen Paul in Portland in many years. We did see each other once in Portland, I think. We did. It actually verified that we both live in Portland. Uh, thank you for coming this morning. Uh, I love speaking first. It gives me an opportunity to get my talk out of the way so I can enjoy the rest of the conference without any concerns. Uh, my name is Keith Packard. Um, I'm currently consulting for Valve, uh, who has a deep and abiding interest in the Linux. I'll stand over here. Uh, deep and abiding interest in, uh, in Linux graphics, uh, as that's one of their primary platforms for, uh, for shipping all of their fine games. Um, they actually support a number of people um, uh, doing Linux graphics development. Um, and one of the things that they're most interested in is improving uh, the open source drivers and the open source graphics stack. Um, and I'm working on kind of the display half of that. I'm talking about some display timing stuff. OK, so we talk about display timing, um, and we talk about animations on the screen. And um, it used to be that you would watch an animation, and you were excited if it was pretty smooth and actually moved on the screen. Um, expectations have risen at this point. Uh, you want an interactive graphics application, so we're talking about something where, you where you're providing input which is changing the scene. Um, and when you have that, um, the, the application really needs to know when the content that it's currently generating is going to be presented. Uh, obviously, we can't, we, we can't have zero latency between uh, rendering and display. Um, and so the application is going to predict what scene the user is expecting to see several frames ahead, uh, computing a scene for that time, and then asking the display system to present it at that time. Um, you also want a constant frame rate. Uh, if you don't have a constant frame rate, the user, the user gets a sense of jerkiness um, and judder, uh, which is very, very uh, disconcerting. Uh, this is uh, true on the desktop. It's very true and, uh, and very important in a virtual reality or augmented reality environment where the, where the uh, primary, one of the primary uh, drivers of the change of the scene is the change of the user's pose. Um, and so if you're moving your head around, you really expect the world to appear steady. Um, and the only way you're going to get that is if the application knows exactly when the frame is going to be presented to the user. Uh, the question is, why is this hard? We, we've been doing uh, 3D animated graphics for how long now? Like 40 years? Um, and yet we still struggle with getting it smooth and making it work well. Uh, these days, there's a lot of moving parts, right? There's a, uh, the, the systems have gotten very complicated. There's a lot of interactions in software and hardware. Um, our display systems have gotten more complicated, right? It used to be you had the monitor and you had the frame buffer. Um, and the monitor was a CRT. And when you provided voltage to the CRT, the phosphors were illuminated. There was no delay between, or no perceptible delay, between providing a signal to the monitor and having the user see it. These days, Monitors can buffer a couple of frames ahead, um, which makes it very difficult uh, for the application to get an idea of when its output is going to be presented. Uh, we also have more sophisticated desktop environments. It used to be that you rendered the scene, and when the application drew something, uh, the next time the scan, the, the, uh, scan out engine went through that pixel, it would display what you had just drawn. Um, and today, we want to have sophisticated uh, desktop events with animations and with uh, with uh, uh, translucency and other effects on the screen. Um, and that means that there's a yet another uh, system in between the application and the display called the compositing environment. Uh, so uh, Wayland is a fully composited uh, uh, windowing system. X has optional compositing. Uh, Windows now uses compositing. Uh, uh, Mac OS X has always used compositing. Android uses compositing. Um, and so the compositing, uh, compositing desktop environment is now kind of standard. Um, and that introduces additional software and additional complexity into the system. And it makes it more difficult uh, to figure out when things are, are, are being displayed. Another big change over the last 20 years has been the introduction of power and thermal management. Uh, so now, instead of the system running at a constant speed, where once you kind of got going, you kind of knew what was going on, uh, now the system will dynamically change the, the, pow the power processing power available, the memory speed, uh, the GPU versus CPU timing. Uh, some systems will actually change the display timing dynamically in order to reduce power. Um, and that introduces an additional source of, uh, a source of um, you know, change in the latency of the system. So measuring the system once and expecting it to continue to behave like that is no longer, um, it's no longer adequate. Um, and, and the other thing is that our, our computational environment has become more complicated. When the CPU uh, was directly drawing to memory uh, and doing all your animation directly with the CPU, um, you knew exactly when the pixels were getting changed on the screen because the instruction to write data into the frame buffer had completed. 
Uh, now the GPU is a massively parallel, separate computer on your machine, and you pass it commands in a queue and say go, and sometime in the future it will have finished that, that, those, uh, those rendering operations. Uh, and synchronizing between the GPU and the CPU is very expensive, and it takes a lot of time. So you want to minimize the number of times that you do that synchronization, and that means that you don't have a good idea of where the GPU is in its computational uh, workload. Um, the display, of course, can't start displaying the first pixel in the frame buffer until the GPU is done rendering the last pixel in the frame buffer. That means that you have a huge amount of latency between when the rendering is complete or the, when the rendering is started and when the display can even think about beginning. And so there's additional latencies, additional complexity. It's just a very complicated environment. I want to show you a couple of, uh, a couple of ways that we do display. Uh, here's kind of the, the classic before Windows system environment. Uh, where the system had two frame buffers, uh, you draw to one, you tell the display, uh, please start scanning out from this thing I've just drawn, and we call that a flip. Um, so with only two buffers, uh, you actually have to wait for the flip to complete before you can start drawing the next scene, and that's why there's, this, uh, that's why there's a delay between the, the drawing operations here. Um, so you draw to one frame buffer, you ask for it to flip. The flip can't happen until the, until the video system is ready. And so there's a, a delay between when you ask for the flip to uh, occur and when it actually occurs. And of course it actually occurs at vBlank. Um, and that delay is wasted GPU time, of course. You know, you're not actually using the GPU. So what applications would do is they'd try to get as much complexity into the scenes they could without going over. Right? So you want, to, you want to have that delay as, as small as possible so you're burning as many watts in your GPU as you can. Um, let's see. Uh, another, another popular mode was instead of flipping the frame buffer, we'll copy from, what, from the, the rendered image onto the active scan out buffer. Uh, this, was, this is common if you're only presenting a subset of the screen. Uh, you don't want to replace the entire screen contents. So you just want to replace the subset. We used to do this um, for, uh, for window DRI2. You do a copy of the contents. Um, this, of course, means that the, uh, in this environment, you're going to wait for vBlank, and then you're going to start the copy. And, the, and the, the hope here is that the copy is going faster than the scanout. So even if you start copying at the top of the frame buffer, you're hoping that you're going to get the copy enough ahead of the scanout engine that the, the pixels that you're going to get going out the display are all the new image. Of course, if, this, if the copy goes a little slower or starts a little bit later, you're going to get an artifact on the screen called a tear, where you see some of the old contents at the top, at the, uh, perhaps the top of the uh, frame buffer, and the new contents at the bottom. And that's, a, that's an undesirable artifact. And so we like to use the flipping technique uh, and so in a composited environment in particular, uh, the, the system works very hard to make sure that you're flipping every time, and that way you know that you're getting a complete frame buffer with no tear. Uh, the problem with that is that if you, if you take a little bit too long rendering, uh, then the flip may not happen at this vBlank. It may happen, it may actually have to wait until the next vBlank, because you can only flip at the vBlank interval uh, typically. Um, and so that means that if you miss this frame buffer, you're going to wait all the way until the next frame, so you're going to miss a frame, and I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, the application here, this is, this is a composited environment that I'm showing, but you can see here the application and the compositing system together are taking just a little bit too long, so you've missed that uh, V-blank interval. And so now that first frame is going to wait all the way until frame number two. Now typically the application has no idea that it's missed V-blank. It may get feedback eventually, but when it's starting the rendering, it doesn't know because it wants to get going right away. And so it's not going to wait for an indication of when that V-blank happened. So it's going to say, OK, I'm going to draw now for frame number two. Uh, uh, and it's going to queue up all of its rendering. And then it's going to tell the compositor, OK, display frame number two. And now the, uh, the compositor is going to say, well, I'd love to display frame number two, but it's not going to be displayed until frame number three because frame number two is, contains the contents of the first thing that I drew. So you can see now that my application is potentially perpetually one frame behind. Um, and what the application is going to do is eventually figure out, oh, I'm a frame behind somehow. It's going to get some feedback from the system somehow. And it's going to drop a frame at that point to catch up again. So now you have two glitches. You have the glitch when you started drawing and you, and you dropped a frame. So now the, frame, the, the, the screen stalled for an entire frame. And now you have another glitch where the animation jumps between two frames uh, because you're going to display one frame earlier than it would have been in a smooth animation like you see um, in this copy. Oh, I'm going in the wrong direction. OK. 
even operate my own device today. This is what happens when you display a frame early. OK, so say your system is rendering, um, and most of the time you're taking uh, over one frame time to, uh, to render the scene. And so you've decided to say, well, OK, I'm only going to display every other frame. Uh, and so you, you, you render up all your content, you get it ready to go, and you say go, and the system says, oh, look, you happen to be early today. Let me display your frame now. And you're like, well, wait a minute, this content is not supposed to be seen now. I'm trying to wait for every other frame. So I get uh, 30 hertz refresh, uh, still smooth looking animation. But unfortunately, because uh, some graphics environments don't have a way to ask, for, uh, ask you to wait for a particular frame, you're going to end up displaying the frame early. And you get an artifact on the screen, even though you're rendering faster than you thought you would be going. So you've got plenty of time. You're not running too slowly. You just computed the contents for the wrong time on the screen. Uh, this actually happens quite a lot. Uh, you see people complaining now that the, the, their, games, their games are jerky. Uh, on, their, on their screen, and it turns out that they're rendering at 30 hertz, but sometimes the frames are arriving early and the application isn't asking for them to be delayed correctly. Uh, one particular reason for this is that the new Vulkan API has no way to ask for, you, for the frame to be displayed uh, at a particular time. There's no, uh, there's no API for that. So you just say go and you get it next. OK, so now we've seen a couple of problems. We've got a kind of a sense of what the environment is. So what are the requirements uh, to get this to work right? So the first thing is the application has to know when the content is going to be seen by the user. It has to be able to know when vBlank is going to occur. Um, and it also needs to know what additional delays are in the display system. Uh, so if you have a monitor which has an entire frame of buffer, or maybe it has a few milliseconds of latency, ideally, the application would be able to know that. Uh, so in the VR headsets that, uh, that HTC uh, produces with, uh, uh, a lot in cooperation with Valve, those actually, we actually know what the display lag in that system is. We've measured it. Right? So we actually tell the application, this display has some lag. You're going to want to produce content that's a little further in the future than you thought so that, you, so that the, the scene as projected is, is projected correctly. Not only that, but we know that the scan out takes time. So you actually want to generate content for the top of the frame, which is at an earlier time than the content of the bottom of the frame. So actually actively reprojecting or recomputing the content as the scan line goes down so that the contents at the bottom of the screen are further in the future than the contents at the top of the screen. So it gets pretty complicated. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting over a cold. Uh, you need to allow the applications to specify when the content is going to be displayed. Uh, there's a couple of extensions that I'll talk about in OpenGL and Valve and Vulkan that are going to, be, uh, they're going to allow you to do this. But that, that control needs to be precise in absolute frames. It's not, please delay two frames. No, I really need to say, this content needs to be displayed at, you know, at you know, 47.3 seconds into the, of absolute time so that I know when that content is going to be displayed. That content needs, that uh, time needs to be synchronized with system time and my device input time so that I, that I can have a global sense of time and know when the content is going to appear uh, to the user. The display system better be able to actually commit to getting to this frames displayed on time. If you can't display the frame on time, uh, when, when the application asks for it, then you're going to get those artifacts that I showed you. Uh, another important part about this, and this is something that's fairly recent, is that we need to tell the applications when the frames were displayed. Um, uh, most graphic systems today run open loop, which is to say you can ask for a frame to be displayed at a particular time, but you may get no idea that, uh, when it's happened. You may be able to, uh, to intuit or figure out when it, when it was displayed just because some things are getting slower. It's like, oh, I, I didn't get that buffer freed as soon as I thought it was going to be freed. I must be a frame ahead now. So you might be able to figure it out, but you need some more positive mechanism of saying, this frame was displayed you know, at 46.4 seconds. Uh, this frame was displayed at you know, whatever, uh, whatever time. Um, and you also want to know when the rendering was done. So you want to know uh, how much time you had after the rendering completed before the frame was needed on the, on the screen. So you, you want to you get a sense of how much margin you have in the GPU so that when your margin starts going down as your scene becomes more complicated, you may want to reduce your frame rate or you may want to reduce the scene complexity. 
um, that GPU time and the display time need to be in the same time domain. Right now, uh, typical, the typical way you get uh, GPU timing information is that the GPU has its own clock. Uh, separate, it's a separate processor, it's got a separate crystal, it's got a separate time domain. And so you can ask the GPU when the thing is completed and it says, oh, that completed at my time at 8.4 seconds. It's like, well, okay, I've got the display time of 40 some seconds and the rendering time of eight seconds. How do those, how do those correlate? And we'll show you how we fix that. Okay, I'm gonna talk about, a little bit about OpenGL, although I haven't been working on it, uh, because this is what was the genesis of the, the current X, uh, the X mechanisms that, that I'll talk about. Uh, the, the extension that I worked on, that, that I looked at most closely was this OML sync control. And this actually lets the target specify which frame count in the absolute frame count uh, the frame will be displayed at. It's got some complicated math about modulus and divisors and all kinds of stuff that you can mostly ignore that because I don't know what they were thinking, but you can actually specify an absolute frame time. Unfortunately, it provides you no, no feedback as to whether that was successful or not. You just get a, you get a okay, so I'm, I promise to display this at some point. Um, you've asked for it to be displayed at this time. It's a start. Uh, another, th another control that was provided earlier in OpenGL is, is swap control, and that, that allows you to specify a relative interval between frames, and that's how applications used to switch from 60 hertz to 30 hertz. They would set the swap control value uh, from one to two, and so you display every other frame. Again, no feedback when the presentation actually occurred. So in Vulkan, we've got a couple of new things. Uh, Google actually came up with an extension uh, for Android called Google Display Timing, and this extension actually allows you to specify absolute times relative to the processor's, uh, the OS time, the clock monotonic on the system. Please display this frame at this clock monotonic value. And it's the display system's job to figure out what that means uh, for the, G for the uh, display engine. Uh, you get feedback for when frames were displayed, again, using the same monotonic value. You also get feedback about how much, uh, how much uh, latency, how much uh, uh, over uh, space you had in the G on the GPU, so you get an idea of how much how much uh, gap you have available uh, to fill up with additional rendering. So you can get an idea of of whether you're running on time. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, because of the Android display system architecture, this is not something you get right away. You don't get this feedback after every frame as soon as it's been displayed. I mean, in fact, in the, in the Android display architecture, this data may be, display, may be delayed by up to five frames. So it may, you may find out that you relate, you know, five frames later, which is an awful, lot of, an awful long time to the user who's got a VR headset strapped to their head and they're attempting not to fall over. Um, of course, in a desktop environment where we're not so worried about power consumption, we're more willing to take the context which is necessary to get that information back to the application quickly. So in my implementation of Google Display Timing on Mesa, uh, you actually get the information uh, very soon after vBlank. The event, the event comes back from the system, wanders its way all the way through the display system, and it's all, uh, all synchronously uh, recorded. Uh, so it's probably within a, less than a millisecond of the actual vBlank that you get this data back. You don't know when the data is going to be available because the API doesn't provide any way for you to figure out when it will be available. Uh, so if you ask too early, then you're not, not going to get the one for the previous frame, which is kind of annoying. Um, uh, another interesting problem is that, the, is that Vulkan provides no way for the application to kind of clock itself by presentations, which is to say, I don't want to get too far ahead of the rendering engine. I want to be always two frames ahead or always one frame ahead or whatever, whatever I need to do in order to cover my, in order to make sure the GPU stays busy. But Vulkan doesn't provide any way for you to clock the application by, by, dis, uh, by displayed frames. It allows you to clock it by available display buffers because when you ask for a display buffer, you can only get one that is idle, and so if the other ones are all being rendered to, well, you're not gonna get one for a while, you'll wait. Um, but the number of display buffers may need to be large for some uh, obscure corner cases. Typically, these days, we allocate four. Uh, so you may not, you, you may, you're, that means that you're gonna have between one and four frames buffered, and you don't know how many it is, which is to say you may get as many as four frames ahead of the, GP, of the uh, display engine in your rendering, which is annoying. Um, the best practice today actually uses um, this uh, Vulkan extension called display control. It only works on direct display environments. It doesn't work in a Windows system. 
Uh, and so we do this with the VR headsets right now. We actually clock the system based upon V blanks coming to the application uh, to make sure that we're no more than one frame ahead. The problem with that, of course, is that we have no idea if the present actually occurred at that V blank. So if we ever get if we ever get behind the display, we have we can't figure it out very soon. It takes us a long time in order to discover that we got a frame behind because we get no immediate feedback. So we want something that's triggered by present, and we're working on working on some extensions. Uh, the, the, in, the easy thing to do here is to implement it on Mesa, and I, I implement it on Mesa, and I get a fence now after the present happens. Uh, the, the only hard part is actually specifying when that is, because there's no really good idea of when the present has completed. It's like, well, did it happen at the V blank? Well, we don't really have a notion of V blank in Vulkan, so there's a bunch of semantics that we need to figure out to, to specify a time that is tight enough to be useful and loose enough to be both testable and implementable. Uh, so we're working on that. Another extension in, in, in the recent vo version of Vulkan is called Calibrated Timestamps. I worked on this one uh, in, in, over the fall. Um, this actually lets you uh, take a function call that gets you back times in multiple domains. So you can get a GPU time and a clock monotonic time that are at the same time. Of course, you know, in our relativistic world, there's no such thing as the same time. But, we, uh, but what the system actually, what this extension actually does is it says, okay, I sampled all these clocks and all of them are within this delta of each other. I sampled them all within this amount of time. Um, and that time is usually, you know, a, way, way less than a millisecond. So we're actually able to give the application an idea of whether the answer they got back is usable or not. Um, and if they don't like the bound that they got, they can always try again. Uh, so that's actually, uh, that actually, I used that in the implementation of Google Display Timing. Uh, so we actually, uh, the Google Display Timing now gives you time, GPU times uh, that are relative to the clock monotonic time that you get for the display, so you can correlate them, which is, which is useful. Okay, so this is what Vulkan used to look like. When you had an application, you would basically say, okay, I'm gonna assume that I'm, uh, that I'm, that I'm, uh, that I'm keeping up with the display, and I'm gonna render a frame uh, for the current time, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna just gonna go present it, and it's gonna get presented at whatever that time is, right? Um, and, then I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna say, okay, the next time that I'm gonna render for is for whatever that current time is, plus however long a frame is, right? So whatever my refresh interval is, I'm gonna render the next frame for the next time. You can see this is running open loop, I get no feedback here. So if I, if I make mistakes, well, they're gonna kinda persist for a while. Um, you, can, you can put some additional tweaks in this to kind of recover eventually, but it takes a while. Okay, so the new Vulkan loop, loop is gonna look like this. I'm gonna render a frame for the, the current time that I wanna show on the screen, um, and then I'm gonna present that frame at that current time. That's obviously a time in the future. Um, I'm sorry, I kind of messed up the code in this loop. I wasn't thinking very clearly. Um, and then I'm gonna go find out when historically frames were presented. I'm gonna get whatever data the system can provide me for feedback in terms of when the frames were displayed. I'm gonna figure out what a reasonable frame step is going to be given what I have been managing in the, in the past. And I'm gonna compute the next, uh, the next time to display based upon that. So here you can see we've closed the loop. Now the display system is providing feedback to the system and I can get it, to, I can get it to, uh, controlled. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about some changes in X. Uh, um, the, the, the awesome part is because of the work we did with the OML sync control extension for GL, the present extension actually provides enough information to close the loop here. It actually provides control over when things are going to be displayed and it tells you when things were displayed. Unfortunately, the implementation kind of lags the capabilities of the extension. When the desktop is composited, there is a bug. Um, Let's see. So in, in X system, when you're doing a flip in a composited environment, um, ideally what would happen is you would do a bunch of rendering, uh, you'd do some compositing, and then you'd wait for a frame to be displayed, right? Uh, and so, oh no, this is the uncomposited case. In the uncomposited case, that little green X box, that's gonna be X just doing stuff to get the frame ready to go. Um, and then it's gonna be flipped onto the screen at the V blank. When you're copying, it's gonna look a little different, uh, you're gonna, you're gonna dr do a bunch of drawing, you're gonna go tell X, hey X, I want this presented. X is gonna do a little bit of work and then it's gonna wait for V blank and then X is gonna do the copy. Uh, and then the application is gonna get notified and the application is gonna go on its way. These work great in an uncomposited case. This is when X doesn't have a compositing manager, so you're running, you're running with uh, all the artifacts that, that, it, that entails. 
Ideally, in a composite environment, it would look very much the same, right? You do a bunch of drawing, you tell X, it would go do some compositing and get it ready for the frame, and then it would get presented right away. Um, and that would be, you wouldn't see any, any big problems. Unfortunately, there's a bug. And the bug is that X, uh, the, compositing, uh, the composite extension and the present extension don't talk to each other. <coughs> the the uh, present extension says, oh, I would like to present the scene. And so it carefully gets the new root window ready to, the new window contents ready to go, and then, and then and it waits for V blank. Because of course it wants to present that, that, that frame at V blank time. And at V blank time it says, oh, time to present. And what do you do to present? Oh, you tell the compositing manager that you'd like to present your scene. And so now at V blank time, you tell the compositing manager, please show the new contents of my window. The compositing manager's like, oh, awesome. I'll go get the new contents and construct a new frame buffer and get a new image ready and wait for V blank. So now you're always a frame behind. Which, could be which would be tolerable if you told the application that, right? If the application knew when it was frame was being displayed, it could probably survive. Yeah, it's an additional frame of lag. Windows does that, applications survive. Unfortunately, it's, it's as bad as you can imagine. X actually tells the application that its frame was displayed when it told the compositing manager to display the frame, which is to say one frame early. Uh, so that's pretty awful. So every frame is, uh, is, is delayed by, uh, uh, by exactly one, fr uh, by one frame or more, and every frame is, uh, the time that every frame is presented is a lie, uh, which is kind of suboptimal. Um, and you can see this in a composited environment, if you've ever done uh, gameplay in a composited environment, it's like, wait a minute, everything is kind of off. Um, and you turn off compositing and it's awesome. Um, Weston, uh, Wayland doesn't, uh, the Weston implementation of Wayland doesn't have this problem because it actually starts compositing slightly before vblank instead of at vblank, uh, which is a, a nice feature. Um, right. So a really simple kludge that I implemented a couple years ago to test out to see if this was actually something that I could solve was to, send the, the, to tell the compositor that there was new window contents right when the present pixmap occurred. As soon as the application called present pixmap, you tell the compositor, hey, there's new content for this window. And the compositor would construct a new root window image and get it displayed at the appropriate frame. Uh, so this worked as long as the application wanted its content to be displayed in the next frame and as long as the compositor managed to get the contents ready in time for that frame. So I was, I was kind of lying to the application because I was telling the application that it's uh, contents were going to be displayed when it asked for them to be displayed. And I was kind of counting on the system to work and keep things in line. So as long as you had uh, plenty of margin in your GPU, this was awesome. Um, and of course it worked in the, unless the application wanted to render at 30 hertz, which was like, well, no, you're going to get uh, rendered one frame early every time. Because it was just, you know, it was a test. It was like, can this work at all? Uh, and I tested that with some, with some measurement stuff I set up at home and it worked, it worked pretty well. That was light, nice. Uh, so I have a, a slightly better X kludge. Um, so now what I want to do is I want to have the X server pen the damage until the right time. And I'll, we'll talk about the right time in a while. Uh, deliver the damage to the compositor at that appropriate time. Remember what damage that I sent to the compositor. So the future damage occurs, I'm going to kind of pretend that that didn't happen. Uh, and now I'm going to send the present events at the same time as the compositor event, the, the compositor gets its present events. So I'm going to tie the presentation, the, I'm going to tell the application that its contents were displayed when the next compositor frame is displayed. So now if, if things work correctly, uh, and then the application is going to get noti notified that its contents were displayed when the compositor displayed its, its, uh, its contents. So the only pot potential confusion here is if there's additional application changes between the time that the compositor started its composition and the time the display occurred. And so uh, the, the X server is making some assumptions that the application isn't doing crazy stuff. The nice thing about this simple clue is that no changes the compositor required. Right? I'm not going to. I'm not going to change what the compositor does. I'm going to send it damage and expect it to present a frame, and I can hide all of the magic in the X server. Uh, a, more, a slightly more principled X fix that I'm planning on doing is to um, actually uh, mark the damage events with sequence numbers, so I can actually tell 
uh, what, uh, what damage the compositor has, 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 has uh, managed to process. So I'm gonna send those numbers to the compositor and the compositor is gonna tell me which damage sequence it, has, it had managed to get to uh, in the process of its presentation. So uh, the goal here is it was, it was just a slightly more principled fix. It's gonna require some changes in compositors, but they're not very major. Basically, the compositor is gonna take a value, add it a last damage that it, event that it processed, and hand it back to the X server. Uh, and that works pretty well. Okay, so now the question is, what's the right time? Uh, I can tell you right now that I've studied a bunch of Windows systems, and they choose, they have different answers. Uh, uh, Windows actually delays your application by an entire frame every single time. Uh, so when you present uh, a frame, uh, Windows uh, uh, starts rendering the composited in, uh, scene containing that frame at the next V blank, just like X does today. Uh, the advantage that Windows has is they don't lie about when your scene is getting presented, so the applications can, uh, can recover from that. But that means in Windows, you're always a frame behind, right? Because this, it, it, and, and so applications often want to get rid of that, and so they go into full screen direct mode, which gets rid of that overhead, but that has all kinds of other, other adventures. Um, on, on, on Mac OS, they, they give you a fixed amount of time within the frame for the compositing. I don't remember how much it is, it's several milliseconds. And that means the amount of time you have to render your application uh, is, is less the total frame time by that amount. So I think it's probably, you know, say it's four milliseconds. So in a 16 millisecond frame, now your application gets 12 milliseconds to render its frame. And if you miss that window, then you're gonna get displayed at the next frame. Um, what I would like to do is do a little, something a little fancier maybe, and maybe I can't. Um, uh, one thing you can obviously do is you can just do a bunch of measurements. We've got huge amounts of data here, right? I can keep track of how long the compositing process has taken uh, historically. Uh, get, a, get a sense if there are any dramatic changes in the environment, like Windows got reconfigured or something. Um, and guess that the, the compositing time for the next frame is gonna either be similar or very different from the previous frame. So I can probably do a better job than a fixed time with some pretty simple heuristics. Another idea that I had that's even simpler than that is to look at when the application which has the user's intent, or which has the user's input focus, and say that when that application does a present, I can probably start compositing right then. And, and just kind of let the other applications float. It's like, well, the other applications come along uh, and render stuff. They may get into this frame if they're early, or they may get into the next frame if they're late. Um, and that seems like a pretty simple heuristic, and I'm gonna go experiment with that probably first. Um, it would be nice if the application would tell me that it was going to do a present this, uh, this frame or not. So it would be nice if the application could say, yeah, I'm running at 30 hertz right now. So if you get stuff from other applications for the intervening frames, go ahead and do a display if you like. Uh, maybe it doesn't matter. Um, and of course, if the, if the application never presents a, a frame, what do I do then? Well, I'm gonna have to fall back on some other heuristics. Uh, so that may, that may make that more complicated. Okay, the final section that I wanted to talk about today was the, the Linux kernel APIs. This is Plumber, so we try to talk about all parts of the system. Uh, the Linux kernel is a part of my environment. Um, the Linux kernel has a, an API for flipping frame buffers that dates from the late 90s, um, from an era when the kernel was, was desperately concerned about allocations. Um, there's a finite number of events you can queue in the kernel. Um, and this is very strangely, uh, strangely managed. It actually counts the amount of space allocated for each, each kmalloc call, literally calls kzalloc, uh, to allocate an uh, allocate uh, event to deliver. And then it says, oh, if we've allocated a lot of those, we're just gonna say no. Uh, which means that the application has to say, oh, I got eBusy back from the kernel. That means I've allocated too many events. Let me go read some events. So here I am in the middle of my rendering processing, trying to get ready to present a new frame, and I gotta go stop, wait, hold on, and go process events about V blanks that occurred a while ago. It's really ugly, and there's no reason for that to be in the kernel. I can literally delete code from the kernel and fix this application problem. Um, and so every application that uses the API has this grotty little kludge. Oh, I got eBusy back. Let me go read some events, and let me retry, uh, which is ugly. Uh, the times provided from the kernel are only in microsecond uh, uh, granularity. The kernel has a nanosecond clock. 
Uh, Vulcan likes a nanosecond clock. Everybody likes nanoseconds these days. I'm sure in 10 years we'll wait picoseconds. Uh, but there's no reason not to provide nanoseconds back to user space. I've already fixed one of the APIs in the kernel to provide nanoseconds. Um, I think we should fix the flip API to provide nanoseconds as well. Um, the other, uh, an, another problem with the Linux flip API is there's only a single spot, uh, a single queue entry in the kernel. Thanks. Uh, when you provide a flip to the kernel, you're going to say, okay, kernel, go ahead and flip, and you, 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 you queue an entry for that particular screen, and you can't change what's queued, you can't add additional things to the queue, you are stuck. You are committed to displaying that frame at that feed length, which means that you want to commit as late as possible but then you're terrified that you're going to miss feed blank because you're going to get you're going to get some uh, interrupt latency in the system and you're not going to get it there in time. So you really want to ideally what you'd be able to do is say, I think I want to display this frame, um, and then at the future be able to come back and say, Yeah, I don't really want to display that frame. Can you display this frame instead? Um, uh, and or I or you'd be able to say unqueue. It's like, Oh, I don't really want to display that frame. I want to get rid of that from the queue. Um, and and uh, and go on with other things, uh, which is really important if you have mo if you change that single queue spot to multiple queue spots. Another problem is that it blocks for rendering. So here I am in my display process, which is supposed to be really nicely asynchronous, but I've got my I've got uh, you know I I got this entire command uh, queue of rendering commands and all the compositor rendering commands sitting there, and I know I want to flip to that, and bef when I ask to queue for display. The kernel synchronously waits for all of that rendering to complete before it will return from the queue. And that means that my Windows system stalls waiting for rendering, which is terrible. Um, which, uh, and the combination of all of these effects is that it means that I really can't effectively support what the Vulkan system knows as, of as mailbox mode. And mailbox mode is, please let me keep rendering frames and display the last one that completed before vblank. Because I, as soon as I commit to displaying a frame, I can't queue new frames, which means that I want to wait really long, but I don't know which frame has completed before vblank because the, the, the queue API synchronously waits for the rendering. Um, it's just a mess. OK, so I want to queue without blocking. This seems really stupidly simple. It's like, yeah, sure, the hardware is going to wait for, for the rendering to be done. Let the kernel deal with that and don't make my application block. Um, the alternative, of course, is to have user space take, uh, take a, an event some time before vblank and queue then. It's like, okay, a millisecond before vblank, user space is going to figure out which, um, which buffer, which of the m many buffers it may want to display um, at this vblank is ready and display the latest one. And I could do all that computation in user space, but that means that now I have to burn a bunch of GPU rendering time in user space because I have to make sure that I get that command to the kernel before vblank happens. And I don't want to do that. I want to be able to queue multiple flips in the kernel. Again, we want to wait for that rendering to, be, rendering to be complete and display the latest completed buffer. But that means that I want to just have all of the, all of the possible frames queued down into the kernel. And for the, when the kernel wants, has, is, you know, is committed to going and picking something for the next frame, so right at vblank or you know, a few microseconds before vblank, when it needs to commit to which frame buffer to display, it should go walk the queue and pull off the latest one which is completed. It can go ask the GPU which of these are completed and pick the latest one and get that into the frame buffer. Um, uh, and it would be nice if I could actually queue for multiple frames ahead. So if I'm playing a movie, I would love to render 10 frames Cue them to the kernel and have the application go to sleep. All right, so I've done all the complicated rendering operations for getting movie displayed. All the buffers are sitting there in memory, and all I want to have happen is at vblank for it to go pick the next one. And now I can get my GPU to go idle for longer periods of time, which would save a bunch of power. Uh, so that would be nice. I would love to be able to cancel queued entries. If I'm going to queue 30 frames ahead, I would really like to be able to hit escape in my movie player and have the movie stop instead of stop in a second. Uh, that would be nice. Um, and it's really necessary if I don't have multiple queues because I need to be able to uh, uh, cancel what's going on and replace it with a future entry. OK, so in summary, uh, what, what, I, what I'm working on right now and what I've nearly finished is extending Vulkan to expose existing X capabilities um, and existing Linux kernel capabilities. So in both X uh, and Wayland and direct to display 
uh, we have all this, all this new Vulkan API available and it works. Um, I want to go fix, I'm working right now on fixing timing under composited X. I had that hack that seemed to work pretty well. I want to go make it more principled. And I want to replace the Linux flip API so that I have all the, all the capabilities that I talked about. Okay, thanks. That's the end of my presentation. If I have questions, please stand up. I think uh, Paul has a microphone. He does. Questions? Nobody's awake yet. Oh, one question over here. We gotta test this out. You're supposed to be able to throw that thing. <laughs> so in X, there are a lot more drawing commands than just uh, present pixel or pixel present, like X draw window and stuff like that. Sure. Are those not covered under this, or is it that one only that one command that? Well, there's a couple of answers to that. The first answer is that uh, 3D applications don't use any of the core rendering, and so they don't matter. The only X rendering command that they do use is this present pixmap command. The other thing is, is that uh, applications that are double buffered, so GTK applications or, or QT applications, do all of their rendering with those X commands off screen, and then take that off screen buffer and present it using that present pixmap. So that present pixmap should ideally be the only place where applications interact with the display engine. That's not true because there are legacy applications that use the core drawing stuff, and they're just going to look terrible no matter what, so we don't care about them. Uh, second question? Yep. Um, uh, under X, who, uh, who's responsible for the compositor? Is it the window managers? Is or so there is, in X, there's, a, there's an external compositing mechanism called the compositing manager. Oftentimes that is integrated with the window manager, but they're, they're technically separate systems, but they're often integrated into a single process because that makes it easier. But that compositing manager is outside of X, and it often uses GL or Vulkan to do the rendering of the scene. And so it gets told about changes in the application contents, constructs a, 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 a total scene of the system, and then calls present PixMap. Because again, that's the only interesting X rendering operation anymore. Question back here. Yeah, get some water. What is the number one thing you wish the GPU would do to help you out? Number one thing the GPU could do to help me out. Um, the, so there's, there's two systems here. So there's the GPU and the display engine. Uh, the GPU could provide um, more accurate signaling about when it's completed without requiring a bunch of complicated synchronization. Uh, so I'd like to know when the GPU is done with operations. We're getting better at that. Um, the other thing that the GPU uh, would be really good to do, and it does, uh, some systems do do, is the GPU could allow me to, uh, to run the compositing system at a higher priority than the application rendering so that I could know that the compositing operations and the uh, application rendering, the compositing operation would take priority. Um, and some, some GPUs do this, so allow multiple threads effectively and to allow me to get some priority uh, for the compositing uh, system. Those would, those would help with the, with, the, with the problems that we have today. Ben? So when you're doing something like VR and you have to deal with the time domain of your input on one side and of, uh, of your output on the other one and keep them in sync, how do you generally deal with the fact that uh, your clock source are going to drift? Uh, in your, your CPU clock and your GPU clock and don't, don't come from the same crystal. They, they're going to drift. Right, Which, and so I told you about that ext Vulkan extension we created to get you a GPU and a CPU time that are closely correlated. You just call that every frame. And now, you, now you, if the clocks drift slowly, you'll resynchronize it every frame. And so you're always within, you know, you're talking about clocks that are a few ppm uh, at, the, at, the, at the worst, and so you're not going to be off by very much over the time of the frame. Yeah, but you don't just want to get it at the start of the application and use it as a constant. You need to constantly refetch those, those synchronized times. No question, just a clarification. I think the kernel API for Atomic only stalls for the go bit. For the what? For the go bit. So basically, you program the registers on the display engine to do the next frame. And he stalls for the go bit, so but basically it, it I was to... looking at the code last night, and it sure looks like it stalls for the frame, uh, waiting for the render to complete most of the time. Maybe not always. I'm talking about well-written drivers. I don't know which one you looked at. Uh, but it's supposed to only wait for the go bit. Basically, you program the registers, and only when, the, when you're sure that the frame can go through, 
you set go and then you wait for the B blank to basically make okay. sure that. Thanks. One short question. Yep. Yeah, since you mentioned scheduling happening at potentially happening on the GPU side, I was actually wondering uh, what the story on the CPU side, if you actually have to tweak priorities or how do you handle uh, the CPU side of things? Uh, fortunately, the CPU side is very low overhead, for, certainly for compositing. Um, there's a bunch of context switching required, but not a lot of actual CPU time. Um, and because you have so many cores these days, we really aren't seeing starvation on the CPU side. Uh, the lack of, the lack of uh, fine-grained scheduling on the GPU is a much more significant concern. Um, obviously, on the CPU side, what we often do is run the compositor a higher priority. Uh, so uh, possibly a real-time priority in order to make sure that it gets CPU time when it needs it. So that's, a, you know, we, uh, the, the operating system is, a, you know, it provides pretty good real-time support these days. Um, and so we really haven't seen a lot of problem there. But yeah, obviously a concern, it used to be a big deal, but processors are fast enough and the overhead is low enough. And we do have some real-time scheduling capability. Well, thank you, thank you very much.